Let's go ahead and take that cover off now instead of waiting this week. Welcome in. <clears throat> this is episode 1.29. So next week will be 30 episodes of, or next episode, hopefully it's next week, will be 30 episodes of Fixer's Heavy Metal History. Hopefully you all have had a good week. Um, have had a busy one. Skin, just good to see you. Hopefully you're feeling well. We have uh, a doozy. And I would say a pivotal episode tonight. You can see on the board, the yes, board Manny. Hello, yep. Eleven Florial year two is um, you know, early April in the Republican calendar. I've been trying to make sure you guys get those dates so we can keep that idea fresh in mind. But this is a bit of a pivotal episode tonight. You will see on the board that there are so many names involved this week that I couldn't put a map up. And that's fine, because we don't need a map. Everything we talk about this week is going to happen in Paris. Also, over two-thirds of the people in front of you right now will be dead by the end of this episode. Which is why we had to put so many names on the board. So, last week... I'm sorry I'm scratching my sideburns here, but it's just itchy. Um, last week, we did a mashup of topics that kind of... Finally started to put a bow on the end of 1793, the year that would never end in the French Revolution. We have uh, spent many episodes in 1793. We are fully going to move into 1794 tonight. We did all of that last week to help set up this clash between Georges Danton and the Indulgence, which are largely on the left side of your screen, even though they should be on the right, and... Jacques Hébert and the Ultras, which is a term we're kind of using, but is not a historical term, during the early months of 1794. This latest battle, and we've had a lot of factional battles in the 29 episodes that we've had so far. This battle was being fought on two lines, and we covered what those two lines were last week, but they... They were the idea of de-Christianization, which the Ultras wanted and pretty much no one else did. And should the terror itself be allowed to continue to ramp up and consume more people? Or should it be wound down, toned down, turned down? Which is what the Indulgence wanted to do. So before we get going here, make sure that you check out your new animated emotes. They finally dropped for me this week. Reception's been pretty good on them. Hopefully you guys like them. I had them sitting on a shelf kind of waiting for the day, but they're all there for you. Some of you hit them on the way in. But again, here we are, another factional struggle. And had the revolution continued on the path and pattern that we've seen since we started talking about this in June of last year, you know, since the Ancien Regime declared bankruptcy back in 1786, the outcome of, of a factional battle wouldn't be in doubt. 
you know, always up to this point, always the radical leftists have won. The the more insane, more progressive, more out there on the left faction has always kind of won at the end of the day, where we always talked about where people were once on the left and then they slipped to the center and then they slipped to irrelevancy. <clears throat> but since the insurrection of September the 5th of 1793, the revolutions have been on a new path. So this time the radicals will be the first ones to go down. And it's not that the indulgents are really going to have much time to savor that victory because they'd be also sent to the guillotine less than two weeks after the ultras are sent to the guillotine. So what's the reason for this change? Why is it no longer just the, the people who had become centrist or conservatives have become irrelevant? The revolution's path now is being paved by Maximilian Robespierre. He is defining what is a true revolutionary now. He's the only one that can see this path. He's the only one that can define this path. <clears throat> and he's able to enforce this path via the Law of 14 Free Mare, which we also talked about last episode, which had just given, at the end of 1793, had just given the Committee of Public Safety pretty much unlimited and absolute power. So the battle that manifests between the indulgence and the ultras, factions which have two things they really don't agree on, it bursts out into the open around the same time that the Law of 14 Free Marriage is passed, in December of 1793. And that's when Camille Desmoulins, so he's extreme left up corner on your grid of people tonight, he launches a new newspaper. And it was specifically designed to counter Jacques Bear, which is of the pencil sketches on the right, the upper left guy. We should all hopefully know who Jacques Bear is by now. But he launches this newspaper, specifically Desmoulins does, to counter Jacques Hébert's own publications, which you will remember he's been extremely radical pretty much since taking up Jean-Paul Marat's mantle. And Desmoulins dubs this newspaper the Old Cordelier. And this naming is obviously a clear attempt to kind of capture way back to the early days of the revolution, which is actually only a couple of years ago, and to reclaim the spiritual ownership of that Cordelier name. Now, the Cordelier section is where the guys like Camille Desmoulins and Fabre de Guntin and Georges Danton came out of when they were kind of iced out of the National Assembly back in you know, 1789. Only a bear could look at what Marat wrote and said, you know, I don't think he was bloodthirsty enough. That's actually a fair assessment of, of Jacques Hébert. So Desmoulins starts this paper. When the original Cordelier leaders, again, Desmoulins, Danton, Deslantin, and others, had graduated up to the level of, you know, actually running the country, the Cordelier club that we all remember, hopefully, that they helped found, it had passed into the hands of, you know, sound culotte backed radicals, more bloodthirsty radicals, and quietly more, you know, off their hinge radicals than even, you know, Desmoulins and Danton had been when they were outsiders. The current president of the still existing Cordelier Club was none other than Jacques Hébert. And I have to think that it hurt Desmoulins and Danton to see this club that you know they and their friends had helped found and really helped drive the revolution from in its early days, really now serving bloodthirsty and sacrilegious, depending on your perspective, ends that the ultras were now running. This club they had built was just, you know, it had slipped into the hands of other people because they couldn't run that and, you know, be delegates at the convention and be on committees and everything else. The first issue of the old Cordelier was published on December 5th, and it flew off the shelves. It was a, a smash hit the day it came out. And the reason why the old Cordelier was extremely popular was because, think about how the revolution has gone down. People have been effectively, since the law of suspects especially has been passed, kind of cowed into silence. 
They are afraid to speak their mind because it may not be in line with what the proper political thinking is. And if you are not in that proper political group think, it's very easy for someone to simply denounce you. And denunciation was all that was needed. Denunciation effectively equals arrest. So these people in Paris had been cowed into silence by this whole radical fury especially coming from the ultras. And they were f happy to finally have somebody somewhere brave enough to like stand up and give voice to the fear of, wait, how, what are we doing? How we're going too far here. This is not, you know, this is not about freedom and you know, individual rights anymore. Look, this is crazy. And that's kind of what the old Cordelia gave to people. It gave a public written document that they could pick up and it said yeah i agree with this because what's going on in reality outside is insane so desmoulin's journalistic attacks and i like the word journalistic i feel like i you know maybe invented it for this one um desmoulin's journalistic attacks were echoed in the convention from the agreement gilly to answer your question they were echoed in the convention. These attacks on the, the excesses of the terror and dechristianization were actually echoed in the convention from the agreement that Danton and Robespierre had that we touched on last episode. They both didn't believe that dechristianization was anything but folly, right? And Danton for sure thought the, the terror itself had gone too far, and Robespierre was kind of on the fence. So... You have these two giants in the revolution. They're kind of backing each other up, as they always have, in the convention, while Dame Moulin, who's also a delegate, is out in the streets publishing a paper saying, we may have gone far too far around the bend here. And then the day after the first issue of the old Cordelier hit, the convention actually passes a decree that reaffirms the right of the French people to freedom of worship. And you have to go back like to the heyday of Lafayette because this is a core part of the Declaration of the Rights of Man. And it was a right that radical dechristianization clearly threatened because you have this movement to take iconography and altars out of churches and to remove crosses from graveyards forcibly. And that is certainly infringing on the rights of others to worship as freely as they want. Interesting, though. This is also the period in history where the term vandalization enters the lexicon of Western language. Because opponents of dechristianization, opponents of the people who you know were going into churches and stripping them, we're comparing this destruction of church property to the destruction of Rome back in 455 AD by a pretty massive tribe that was known as the Vandals. So the Vandals sack Rome, and in France in 1793-1794, vandalization, the destruction of churches, is being drawn back to the Vandals sacking Rome. And that's where vandalize and vandalization as a word you know today comes from. So in the third issue of the old Cordelier, which was published on December 15th, so he's pumping it out pretty fast. He went from his first issue to his third issue in 10 days. Desmoulin drew from another Roman source, a scholar named Tacitus, who I actually have Tacitus's work sitting right over there. He draws from Tacitus, and Desmoulin draws a parallel between revolutionary Paris in 1793, and Tiberius, who was, if you need the time frame on that, Julius Caesar, Augustus Caesar, Tiberius. That's the time frame. So right after the turn of the century, 0 AD, or 1 AD, is when Tiberius comes to power in Rome. And the period under Tiberius was a time of fear and brutality, especially at the end of Tiberius' reign. It had spread through Rome. Tiberius is kind of ruled by fear had spread through Rome like a sickness, crippling what was once a great civilization in the mind of Tacitus. 
Tiberius more just didn't want the job. He just kind of didn't have a choice is why he was ruling by fear near the end. He had made too many enemies. But the parallel of France in late 1793 and Tiberian Rome both being consumed by a sickness is what is the core of this third issue of the old Cordell Yee said. And with that rhetorical foundation laid, you know, Dave Moulin has it out into the public. The original Cordell Yee stalwart, our buddy Fabra de Glantine, then stands up in the convention and he denounces two primary carriers of the dreaded sickness that was alluded to in the rhetorical references to you know from Tacitus. Charles Philippe Ronson, who is extreme right bottom row pencil sketch guy, and Francois Nicolas Vincen, who is right next to him to his left. Now Ronson was the leader of that Paris Revolutionary Army that was stood up in the aftermath of the insurrection in September of 1793. And he was just getting back into town from no place other than Lyon, where he had been a zealous, really zealous accomplice of Jean-Marie Collot de Bois, who was the guy who was really in charge of, you know, killing everybody out there. Now, Vincent was General Secretary of the War Department, effectively Secretary of War. And he had been using that position to push for an even more rigorous application of the Great Terror. So these guys, both on the right here on your screen, were both ultras. They were leftist radicals. It would have made a whole lot more sense if I had done it backwards. But So both these guys, Ranson and Vincent, which makes it easy for me to group them together, were both arrested on December 17th. This is after, you know, Dame Moulin goes out there and says, there's a sickness. And Deglantine says, yep, and those two guys got it. I denounced them. But that was good enough under the law of suspects. And remember, Deglantine is still seen as not a treacherous rat yet, right? Soon, but not yet. So, Vincent and Ronson were arrested on December 17th, 1793. And a few days later... Robespierre gave his outright approval to form within the government yet another committee. This committee would be tasked with investigating wrongful arrests, if that's not, you know, the craziest thing you've heard so far, because how many wrongful arrests have there been so far in the French Revolution? But this committee <clears throat> was supposed to be <laughs> investigating wrongful arrests. Yeah, almost all of them. This oversight panel, this new committee, was supposed to function as a check on those who wanted to turn the terror into a general bloodbath. Well, I mean, it's probably too little too late, but it was supposed to act as some sort of check to say, whoa, you're basically, you're killing the wrong people or you're killing too many of them. Yeah. The city's burnt down, let's make a fire department. Yeah, democracy's burnt down, let's put a check in that re that reestablishes democracy. It's a pretty good analogy. So the surprising and more be it the popular, how popular the attacks on their position, how popular they were and how surprising they were, they caught the ultras off guard. They caught them off guard because they thought that they had like pretty much the momentum of the people and the will of France behind them. But despite this flurry, which had taken two of their more, I wouldn't say popular, but more recognizable leaders, and throw them in jail, they did regain their footing in a few days. When Jean-Marie Collot de Bois found out that Ranson had been arrested, I mean, basically they were co-conspirators, they were co Club blood thirsty maniacs out in Lyon. When he found out that Ranson had been arrested, well, De Bois raced back to Paris from Lyon, and he reached the capital on December twenty second. And then he went down to the Jacobin Club, not to the convention of which he was a delegate, not to the Committee of Public Safety of which he was a member, but to the Jacobin Club, and he denounced what he saw as a sudden turn to spinelessness. And this speech from De Bois kind of re-energized, reinvigorated, and reestablished the morale of the ultras. 
and I'll paraphrase one of the parts of his speech. When I left, we were committed to the goal of purging France of her enemies. And now I return to find the most patriotic men we have in jail? And that sentiment was his rallying call. He got everybody behind the idea that, hey, we're the guys out there defending this thing. We're the guys out there doing the hard work that no one wants to do. And now you're going to throw us in jail for doing it? That was really what he was saying. And then Desbois teamed up with his fellow radical, the other guy who was appointed to the Committee of Public Safety to mollify the sans culotte again back in September, Jean-Nicolas Bilot Varenne, immediately to his right. So you got the four guys down in the middle down there. And there's Desbois, the pencil sketch, and Varenne is to his right. And together, Desbois and Varenne quickly got that whole new oversight panel that was supposed to stop the maybe illegal, the wrongful arrests. They got that panel shut down like that because they were both on the Committee of Twelve. They were on the, that panel of Twelve who were dictatorially overseeing everything in France. <clears throat> and they got it turned off before it even got turned on. So as 1793 is coming to a close, finally, it looked like the Committee of Public Safety itself might become some kind of front in the war. Remember to clonk that follow button. That it might become some kind of front in this war between the indulgence and the ultras, and maybe even a casualty of it. Now, there was for sure people on the Committee of Public Safety <clears throat> who leaned indulgent, and there were certainly people on the Committee of Public Safety who leaned ultra. So something that could have been a good thing never came to be, yes, in the Oversight of Wrongful Arrest Committee. But again, as we draw the year to a close, it really looks like the Committee of Public Safety was kind of teetering. That it was, you know, there are certainly people in it on a leftist side or a you know more centrist right side. And this could have become a place where these factional lines that are out in the convention and out in the streets between the ultras and the indulgents could have blew, blown up inside of the Committee of Public Safety and maybe destroyed it. But that is when what is known as the East India Scandal blew up in the middle of France politically and changed the dynamic of everything. To some of the questions in chat, or at least Gilly's comment, those who do dastardly deeds often look poorly upon the idea of oversight or accountability. Yeah. Hashtag capitalism. <laughs> Let the free market run. No one will cheat. But again, 1793 ends. This this fight's a fight between the ultras and the indulgence. But it didn't consume the committee because the committee got unified by what is known as the East India scandal. This is because in the current climate, this climate of there's some ultra-leaning people and some indulgent-leaning people within the 12, the critical swing vote on the Committee of Public Safety was Maximilian Robespierre. And because he was kind of in the middle, able to kind of steer things where he wanted from his political position, he was able to really define what was acceptable and what was not within this dictatorial committee of 12 men. And he had been leaning toward the indulgence, right? He had been, because he had been out there with Danton. And we just talked about it. We've talked about it. We talked about it last week, too. We've talked about it throughout this entire series where Danton and, and, and Rosepierre tend to kind of, they don't like each other. They might not be buddies, but they tend to have each other's backs politically. But when the East India scandal dropped, it made Robespierre straighten up real quick. Because remember, he already has Fabra de Glantine's foreign plot nonsense in his ear from a couple months ago, and he's already suspecting Marie-Jean Hérault on the Committee of Public Safety, that noble member of the Committee of Public Safety, of, you know, being a rat. And now, when the <clears throat> East India scandal breaks, it makes, it makes Robespierre maybe not lean so much into what the indulgence are say, saying, because a lot of the indulgence are wrapped up in the East India scandal. 
So the East India scandal. Let's start first with what the heck is the East India Company, right? We all have heard it. We've heard it, though, from a British perspective. Most of the people in the West who have any any understanding of the East India Company, it will tease one thing. It's a lot of things, but we'll get there. No way. Yes, way we'll get there, Ted. But we've all understood it from a British perspective. And the thing that really is important to understand is the way that the British East India Company was structured and the way the French East India Company was structured was pretty much the same. They were supposed to do the same thing. So as I go through tonight, I will say East India Company in reference to the French East India Company. If I mean to reference the British East India Company, I will say the British East India Company because I'm going to say East India Company a lot. But the East India Company in France was chartered by Louis XIV back in 1664 to help the French compete with the English and the Dutch who were dominating seaborne trade in the rapidly expanding Oriental trade market, so the Far East. And this is a state-chartered company, meaning the state has granted a charter to it. And the company, both in Britain and France, was given a monopoly over trade in the Pacific and Indian Oceans. So take that to American history for a second. The British East India Company, the British East India Tea on the docks in Boston that creates the Boston Tea Party was tea that came from the Far East. They had exclusive monopoly rights to that tea and bring it back into the Atlantic. And the problem at that point is twofold. One, it was supposed to go to Britain and be auctioned at what's known as a tea auction. You want to know anything about that? And instead it was shipped directly into the America. So the problem in America was here is a state chartered monopoly, not open to the rigors of competition, putting tea directly into our markets and souring those markets. That was the problem that created the Boston Tea Party. It was directly tied to the way that the British East India Company was structured. So the French East India Company, again, not to be confused with its British counterpart, which you're probably all likely you know, at least acquainted with in the Pirates of the Caribbean's movie, it was a mess. And everyone discovered very quickly over the next century that the idea of state chartered monopolies are a pretty terrible idea. So as the ministers of then Louis XV attempted to make some really necessary financial reforms in the wake of the Seven Years' War, known in the United States as the French and Indian War, the East India Company in France was abolished in 1769. So it lasted for about, you know, about a century. But 16 years later, the company was rechartered by none other than Controller General Cologne. And it was again given a monopoly on the trade east of the Cape of Good Hope, which is the tip of Africa, for those of you that didn't do well in geography. So this new monopoly that was given to the newly rechartered French East India Company was supposed to run for about seven years. Well, seven years. But then the French Revolution came along and, you know, in 1789 and in January 1790, the more free market inclined delegates of the National Assembly took the French East India Company and said, no more monopoly for you. So you have a company, a state-chartered company, who has enjoyed protections from free market by nature of the way it was built. And now it's exposed to the terror of free market competition. And so it predictably started to implode. And by the summer of 1793, the East India Company in France was limping on toward its death. It was insolvent. It wasn't worth anything. It was worth its assets. It was worth its ships and warehouses and things like that. It's logistics chains, but it wasn't worth anything else. It was finally put out of its misery when the newly reshuffled Committee of Public Safety that we know now as the 12 banned all joint stock companies in August 1793. And the way that the French East India Company was structured was as a joint stock company. You don't want to worry about what that is either. But the, the point is that the edict that declares joint stock companies to be illegal 
is what finally puts the nail in the French East India Company. And because of that, it was ordered to liquidate all of its assets by January 1st, 1794, right where we are in our narrative. So the things that are important here, the East India Company in all of its forms that you probably can find in history from European nations establishing these state chartered mon monopolies on trade out in the East were all bad ideas. They were all really corrupt and they were not handled well economically. And even though they had monopolies on markets, they couldn't make money. Because people didn't like the fact that there wasn't competition. You're, you're in an Adam Smith era of capitalism emerging into the world. And people are just like, that's not fair. And so things like the American Revolution happened. I'm not saying it's the only reason, but it's, it was certainly a contributing factor. But by the end of its life, beginning of January, at the beginning of 1794... We are in a position where the company that has been in existence in a, in a couple different ways is dead. It's dead legally. It's dead financially. It's dead. So it's a failing company. And that's how you kind of have to look at it. It's a failing company, kind of like Blockbuster, right? Blockbuster had storefronts. Some of them they owned. They had a little bit of logistics change. Anytime a business goes down, they have a going out of business sale, right? The scandal's complex. But... Here's the summary of it. Yeah, it's spooky how often history repeats itself. Dustin, welcome in. The scandal is complicated. And I'm going to kind of whittle it down to why it matters for us in terms of the politics of the French Revolution. But with this company, the French, the French East India Company, slated for liquidation, coming through the fall and into the winter of 1793, Financial speculators, heard that term before, haven't you? With insider information, started to manipulate the liquidation process to reach huge profits for themselves by, wait for it, selling the stock of the company short, which means betting on everything failing. This in and of itself was not the scandal. The scandal is when certain members of the convention discovered this illegal stock manipulation because it was illegal to short the stock at the time. But when members of the convention... Bogus. Oh, yes. It is bogus. Pretty much, Dustin, to a degree, except GameStop is a, is a counter to short sellers. Um... The whole GameStop thing on Robinhood is an attempt to counter short selling a stock that you know you're trying to make fail. But the scandal of this is not the illegal stock manipulation. It is when certain members of the convention discover that this illegal stock manipulation is going on in the last three months of 1793. And rather than doing something about it, as they should have been doing as public servants, they said, hey, Cut me in, and I'll look the other way. These delegates of the convention threatened to expose and turn in the speculators over to the Revolutionary Tribunal unless, you know, you give me a cut. You cut me in. You pay me with your a portion of your profits. You cut me into your, your deal, and I'll look the other way. And to make sure that no one else was tipped off to this extortion, the convention committee assigned to oversee the company and its liquidation secretly altered the rules of the liquidation process, which allowed the East India Company to manage the sale of its own assets rather than have government accountability overseeing how the process was being done. If this isn't a life lesson of modern economics, everybody, I don't know what is. You took away the oversight from a governmental level in order to facilitate a corrupt stock sale and then government officials who lifted those oversights has to be cut in. This change to the rules would, of course, 
mean fewer questions about what was being sold, for how much, and to who. And of course, whose pockets the money from the sale was actually going into. Well, I have to start here because this sets up how the indulgence go down. And yet it still happens. This is why I find history extremely interesting because here it is. The French East India Company scandal in 1793-1794 in a microcosm is why free markets without oversight are really, really bad. And you can't argue it. Look at what happened here and it's like, yeah, that's terrible and it should never happen again. 200 years later, 200 and what, 230 years later, almost, we're sitting here doing the same crap. Except we actually allow short selling now. So, this committee, which lifted the oversight, right? They had to sign their name and change the rules very quietly to allow the East India Company to sell its own assets so everybody else could get a little bit richer off of the extortion and insider trading and short selling. The committee that was responsible for those rules. Guess who the chairman of that committee is? I'll take your guesses in chat. Guess who the committee chairman was? Not Danton, no. Deglantin, that is correct. Deglantin. You mean the guy who went to Maximilian Rosepierre earlier in the fall and said, oh, there's a foreign plot over there, and you should really pay attention to that because don't look at what we're doing over here. Mr. Foreign Plot himself. Wouldn't you know it, but Fabra Deglantin was the chairman of the committee, and he was the one who actually signed his name to the crooked paperwork after he was promised a super fat, you know, bribe, which is pretty much his MO. And that was the fatal mistake for Deglantine. Yes, I'm excited about this gift <laughs> <laughs> That was the fatal mistake for, for Deglantine. Now remember, I mentioned way, way back when I introduced the trio of Danton, Desmoulins, and Deglantine and then especially at the insurrection of August the 10th, which kind of catapulted them all to power, that Danton was going to regret his friendships. This is the reason why he is going to regret his friendship with Deglantin. Because it's not going to be a fatal mistake for just Deglantin. It's going to be a fatal mistake for Danton and Desmoulins and some other people. So, by mid-October 1793, the fishiness of this whole liquidation process of the East India Company, which had been going on for a couple of months, really started to stink. And that's when Deglantin decided to try to get out in front of it, before it all blew up in his face and out into the open. That's when Deglantin went to Robespierre and said, foreign plot, Marie-Jean Horo is in on it. The foreign plot just so happened to implicate all of his accomplices in the East India extortion racket. And like we talked about at the time, but I didn't tell you why he was doing it. By coming forward first, Deglantine was hoping to be insulated from the East India scandal. And he was for a little while because... When another one of the com compromised delegates came to Robespierre in mid-November with his own version of events and what was going down, Robespierre assumed exactly as Deglantine had planned, that this was revenge. This was somebody trying to come at Deglantine because Deglantine was already out there saying that guy is doing something else. So it made, in Robespierre's mind, the foreign plot very real, and the East India Company scandal, very not real. He had, Robespierre did, he had this foreign plot in his hand already, and remember we talked about it, he bought it. He swallowed it when Deglantine walked in. Deglantine was a charismatic guy. So when someone else comes down and says, whoa, 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 that's complete horse crap, there's this other thing going on. Yeah, I'm a part of it, but you need to know. Here, I'm going to put it on the table. Deglantine's a part of it. 
Rose Pierre goes, wait, there's no way. You, you got to be, no, that's smoke. Because now you're just trying to put something else on the table to confuse everybody. Deglantine's already come forward. He's an honest guy. That was the perspective. However, at some point in late December, early January 1794, Robespierre was handed incontrovertible proof of Deglantine's involvement in everything that was going down in the East India sale. And it probably was all the falsified paperwork, including the rules changes that he had signed in his own hand. So, of course, yeah, well, he really did now. <laughs> So, of course, Robespierre was pretty upset, right? One, you have all these people on the convention who are taking advantage of their position of power. And that's completely in, not consistent with what Robespierre believes these people should be doing. He is pretty virtuous at the end of the day. He's, he's a lot of things. Greedy wasn't one of them. Power mad probably wasn't one of them. He really believed in what he was doing. So when he sees all these guys out there making a buck... Or, you know, $10 million off of what they were doing. He's really, really mad about it. And then doubly so because it was clear as day to anybody who had any knowledge of the foreign plot that Robespierre himself had been duped by the very slick-talking Deglantine. So it was kind of embarrassing for him, right? He bought the foreign plot hook, line, and sinker. And then... He had to re he realized and everybody around him who kind of saw him walk in, in into the office the next day was just like you know they got him it was there is that palpable yeah he just he got owned he got owned by Deglantine for a couple of months so on January eighth seventeen ninety four and this is diff this is unique not unique but rare Robespierre himself and not Saint Just Saint Just is the guy who would walk into the convention and denounce somebody, right? His job was basically to denounce somebody at the direction of the committee, and de denunciation pretty much meant you're arrested, you're going to the conciergerie, your, tr your trial's going to last three days, and you're dead, right? That's why he's the angel of death, because when he walked down the stairs and started talking and denounced somebody, you were pretty much a dead man. But in this instance, Robespierre is the guy who comes down to the floor to denounce Deglantine. One, he was really sure about it. And two, he was really mad about it. And so four days later, Deglantine was arrested. But as one always ready to embrace a guilt by association mentality, Robespierre could not believe that Deglantine's corruption was simply the result of an individual's ethical failings. It couldn't just be one guy. It couldn't just be that Deglantine himself was a money-hungry scumbag who was using his position to get rich. It couldn't be that simple. It doesn't work that way. He had to have accomplices. The spirit is corrupted morally and pervasively into others. These are things that Robespierre believed. So to Robespierre, this was the proof that the indulgent faction that Deglantine fronted for was also compromised in some way, to some degree, that there were others within the indulgence that had to have been a part of it, actively, assisting, helping, making money, and his, his conspiratorial mind goes bananas on it. Yet, this is where Danton regressed the friendship. Robespierre was only further convinced of this when Danton stands up in the convention to defend Deglantine. And Danton was the only member of the convention who was willing to stand up and defend Deglantine. In Robespierre's mind, in his conspiratorial mishmash of what he thought and how he thought people were, there was just no way 
that Danton could be motivated by old ties of personal loyalty. Why defend him? Because some people believe in their friendships. They believe that I'm in a position of power. I am still legitimately trusted. And yeah, he's probably guilty, but I can at least make a case for some semblance of mercy because he's my friend, because we've been through so much together. When you go through war, and these guys have been through war for several years, the bond that forms between individuals is very, very strong. And so I would almost say that Danton felt that he had to defend Deglantine. Fish, you home or still in Canada? But Robespierre couldn't believe that Danton had that level of conviction for his friends. He believed it had to be something more sinister. Yeah, the airport. Airport on the way home. Well, safe travels. Thanks for hanging out with us while you're on a, on a road, Fish. Hopefully you get home safe. And then, in another unfortunate coincidence of timing in this whole deal with Deglantine going down, just as Deglantine's guilt was coming to the light, Desmoulins used the old Cordel Yee to criticize the Committee of Public Safety and specifically the leadership of of Robespierre. So you have Deglantine, who's absolutely guilty. You have Danton, who's standing up to defend his friend. And just, ugh, horrible timing. Desmoulins stands up with his paper and says, wait a minute, what's going on with these 12 guys, especially Robespierre? And you can start to see how it emerges for the indulgence. We're going to take our first break. We're going to continue on the East India scandal for a little bit when we get back and then get into the ultras side of things. So make sure you stand up, walk around, get a drink, all that fun stuff. I'll be back in a few. You had to get a real meal at least for sure. All right, we'll be back in a few minutes. I'll talk to you in just a few. to clonk that follow button.
Welcome back. I had to ditch the sweater because it was way too warm and then the hat was too warm as well. But welcome back. So as we wound down the first sec section of stuff today, we were talking about how Deglon Teen's incontrovertible guilt in the East India scandal came to light. And then Robespierre denounced him and got him arrested. And then Georges Danton stood up and defended him in the convention and then Camille Desmoulins paper the new paper he was running the old Cordelier ran an article in its most recent edition that criticized the committee of public safety and specifically the leadership of Maximilian Robespierre and Robespierre has taken all this in in the context of Deglantine duped me <clears throat> and it's not possible <clears throat> excuse me it's not possible that this guy was just acting on his own his friends weren't in on it so here you go, here it is, a conspiratorial pattern. And as we know, the French Revolution loves nothing better than a good conspiracy. Robespierre sees a conspiratorial pattern between Deglantine, Danton, and Desmoulins, and they had been friends for several years and working together for a long time since, you know, before the Bastille fell. So it's a lot of easy lines to, or dots to connect for Robespierre. But Desmoulins had strayed over the line once before with his paper. In that case, in that time, Robespierre had just ordered that the offending issues, the copies of that offending issue, just be burned. But by mid-January, with the East India scandal swirling around, word just went round to the printers of Paris that, hey, if you're taking in the plates from this guy and printing the old Cordelier, that's a dangerous thing to be caught printing. And because of that, it was only after considerable delays that De Moulin, remember he's on a pace where he was printing, you know, three issues every 10 days. It's only after considerable delays that De Moulin was able to get the sixth issue of the old Cordelier published by February 3rd, 1794. This would also be the last issue of the old Cordelier. After three months of being a paper and wildly successful and popular, the old Cordelier was killed, stoned dead by politics. Now with Robespierre coming to believe that the indulgence as a group were a bunch of self-serving partisans, he really started to go in for a wilder idea. That not only were the indulgence as a group bad, but the idea of factional fighting in general was dangerous to the nation. So the idea that there is a party out there, they platform, and an opposition party arguing against it, and the concept that they come together to compromise to find a middle road, which is the basically Jeffersonian democracy, that concept to him was dangerous. The idea that there were people who disagreed were da was dangerous. Robespierre came to believe that everyone needed to stop bickering and come together as one you know, or, or else. And as an olive branch to the ultras, Ronson and Vincent were released from jail in early February. Now, these are the guys that Deglantine had denounced as being poison, right, in the taciturn style of oratory that Desmoulin had put in the old Cordelier. But Robespierre releases Ronson and Vincent to get the ultras to calm the hell down. Because these were two major figures within the Ultras party. Or the Ultras group, because they weren't really a party. And they were released from jail in early February. And it was hinted to them and the Ultras that this would be a really good time to take the high road here and not seek any sort of reprisal. And then Danton tried to get in the spirit of not bickering by publicly applauding the release. No way! Yes way! Danton tried to get into this, this idea that Robespierre, kind of in an ally move, 
kind of backing Rose Pierre, said, yeah, that's a good idea. Release Ronson and Vincent. But then he also undermined himself by also saying, and you should release Fabra Deglantine. That didn't go over very well. Because while Ronson and Vincent were crazy, bloodthirsty lunatics, there wasn't written proof that they had been, you know, extorting money from a illegal stock sale. It's a little different. At least it was different in the time. And also, Rose Pierre had already sold himself on the idea that everybody around Deglantine was simply corrupt. Yeah, he's been implicated in a crime with absolute proof, which doesn't happen so often in the French Revolution. Then on the 5th of February, Rose Pierre laid out his vision for the future in a speech to the convention that is entitled historically Reports on the Principles of Public Morality. Now, this establishes Rose Pierre's Republic of Virtue, which we are going to talk about next episode because it's just too much for even half an episode. This speech happens on the 5th of February. And just to give you a heads up, that Republic of Virtue will only be achieved after everyone who is not virtuous is murdered. But the reason I mention this speech right now is because after he gave this speech in early February, Robespierre actually became very sick and he disappeared off to bed for about a month. And while he was gone, the number of people who took his advice on coming together and stopping the bickering was this many. Zero. Nobody did it. As soon as Ranson and Vincent were let out of jail, they, along with the Ultras, started to gear up for a big fight. And part of their reasoning is pretty sound. They could see the effect of the law of 14 free mare and saw how the Committee of Public Safety was using their absolute authority now to stifle dissent on all sides. And they really felt that if they didn't do something about it now, they might not have another chance. And, oh, you mean Robespierre is sick, the linchpin of everything in the middle? If it's not now, it's never. But, unlike the last two years or so, when the forces of winter had kind of helped muster the force of San culotte anger into political action, this time, the drive to an insurrection went absolutely nowhere. And it's not that the sections of Paris weren't getting restless, they were, as usual, there were commodity shortages in the capital. But, you remember, the general maximum had gone some way towards alleviating the problem of the spiraling cost. But it also had mostly just pushed everything into a thriving black market that even the guillotine threat couldn't get shut down. There were street clashes between people in the streets of Paris regularly throughout uh, February, and those that that civic up unrest, that just that fighting, looked tappable to the ultras. It looked like, yeah, look, they're just as angry as they always are. We could do something with that. We could use that. We could exploit that, as has always been done with the common people of France throughout the revolution. The common people's anger has always been tapped in order to get the objectives of the leaders of the revolution done. So, from their base in the new Cordell Yee Club, Jacques Hébert and the Ultras started to try to organize yet another Paris insurrection. This is when they discovered that by early 1794, that well, that deep well of sans culotte political wrath that has been driving things since before the National Assembly, that tappable force of street fighters, Eh, that well was pretty empty at this point. It had been sucked dry, purposefully, in the wake of all the decrees passed 
back at the insurrection of September the 5th, 1793, which ironically was an insurrection that Jacques Hébert himself orchestrated. You have to remember that for this average sans-culotte, every decree they had ever wanted had already been enacted. The general maximum, the law of suspects, punishments for hoarding, men they trusted in Desbois and Varenne being placed on the Committee of Public Safety. And on top of all of that, the convention had just passed the law of Ventos at the end of February and early March, which promised to take the property confiscated from suspects and emigres and redistribute that to the poor. All that sounds great. Everything they ever wanted. That's literally the laundry list of everything that Song Kula had wanted for years. And that's also to say nothing for the payments they were still all getting from showing up and just watching all of the sectional assemblies. Because remember, that was put into place. Here's money for showing up, so you'll shut up. And this was all working out. Everything that they had done in the aftermath of the insurrection of, of September the 5th was working out exactly how the Committee of Public Safety wanted. They got all these edicts enacted back then and had called the enrage at the same time. And because of how effectively they did all of that, any possible fire had to do any more insurrection had been extinguished in the streets. There won't be any more street uprisings. And all of this made it very difficult for Hébert and the Ultras to convince the Parisians that there was a need for another revolt. I mean, look at everything that we've done. Look at what's happened since they took power. The Committee of Public Safety had pushed the Allied armies out of France. They ended the Federalist Revolt. They quelled the Vendée Uprising. And on top of all the decrees that they had passed that you asked for, everyone out in the street was pretty much on the side of the committee. They're like, nah, it's not great, but it's sure better than it was. And they're doing what looks to be a decent job and listening to us. That was the street perspective. Even though it was a very cynical program designed to shut you up and you know, we'll say we're doing things, but doesn't mean we're actually doing them. So that leads us to the not-so-insurrection of March the 6th, 1794. Despite all of these conditions that made it improbable for there to be enough energy in the street to do anything, the ultras pressed on. And on March 4th, 1794, they launched a new incarnation of Jean-Paul Marat's Friend of the People newspaper under the same name. Obviously, trying to recapture some of Marat's magic in the same way that Dame Moulin was trying to spiritually recapture the Cordelli with his paper. And in the first issue of the new Friend of the People, they scheduled a mass demonstration. And so two days later, March 6th, a bear and the ultras led a mob out of Section Marat, which is now what the Cordelli section was being called. And they took their group off to the Hotel de Ville. But not one, not a single one of the other 47 Paris sections followed their lead. And you have to remember, all of these popular revolts, they kind of germinate in the Cordelli section, but the rest of Paris, at least two-thirds of Paris, largely lumps in and says, yeah, let's go. That didn't happen. Not a single other Paris section followed their lead. It was due to a combination of poor planning, because they only did two days, but then all the conditions we just talked about. No one was interested. So there won't be an insurrection of March the 6th historically because it pathetically fizzled out and all of the people who even came to it from Section Marat, they all just went home. So while the ultras found themselves obviously unsupported from below, they had no street support, they also found themselves unsupported from above. 
This was the moment. Now you can say you could say a lot of things, but you have to agree that Jean Marie Collot de Bois was an ultra. He was one of the most bloodthirsty representatives on mission. He was the guy who took over for Couton in Lyon and murdered a lot of people methodically. You know, firing squads, blowing off their legs with cannons. He was an ultra. But this was the moment for De Bois when he realized that it was far better for himself to stay in power with the Committee of Public Safety, because he was one of the 12, than to lead an insurrection against it, tear it all down, and start over yet one more time. So he went down to the Jacobin Club and gave another fiery speech. The last one that we talked about being in defense of Ranson. But this one was about the importance of sticking with the revolutionary authorities. Look at all the good we've done. Don't throw it all away for the sake of a few crazy radicals. So he is the definition of a rat that could see the ultra's downfall coming and cut his ties at the right moment. At least for now. His speech from Desbois successfully kept the Jacobins, as large as, as they are, primarily on the side of the committee. And the ultras, all of the sudden, found themselves dangerously isolated. And after that, it really doesn't take that much time for the guillotine to fall. Because they did try to organize an insurrection, right? So first, all of the members of the Committee of Public Safety, all of them, were collectively re-elected to their, their seats on March the 10th, 1794. And then Robespierre comes out of his sudden illness, more ready than ever to destroy the ultras after they had, you know, really poorly tried to overthrow the government. So on March 13th, none other than Louis Saint-Just walks down the steps of the convention and does his job as the angel of death, denouncing the radicals in the ultra faction in front of the convention as agents of, wait for it, a vast foreign plot designed to discredit the revolution. The next day, Hébert, Vincent, and Ranson were arrested, along with about a dozen or other so-called foreigners, living in Paris, including the colorful Prussian Ancarsis Klutz. Now, I haven't talked about Ancarsis Klutz. He's been around pretty much since before everything has started. He's not been meaningful enough to really mention for anything, but he was on the leading edge of every crazy radical idea the whole way, and I'm mentioning him now because it's just in time for him to die. Hey, welcome in, my friend. Happy to see you. So this group, Hébert, Vincent, Ranson, Klutz, and a bunch of others were collectively tried together as one group in the tribunal from March 31st through March, sorry, March 21st through March 24th. That's that three-day rule on charges of fomenting insurrection. Well, they're guilty of that. Intentionally inducing famine. Probably not. Plotting another prison massacre, like the September massacres. I don't know about that one. And apparently this was all at the direction of British Prime Minister William Pitt the Younger, of which there is no proof whatsoever. And of course they were all found guilty. And as things worked, they walked out of the tribunal, back into the conciergerie, and then they were led directly to the scaffold. Apparently, their executions, the executions of the ultras throughout the entire scope of the Great Terror and the French Revolution, they draw the largest crowd of any execution, eclipsing both the executions of the king and the queen. And that might seem surprising, right? Whoa! Hebert was the voice of the people until three days ago. Well, until March 6th, but, you know, until three weeks ago. This guy was the voice of the people, and he has the most attended execution ever in the history of the revolution. And then think about it the other way. This is the guy, 
and his group of friends who were effectively calling for everybody who didn't agree with them to have their head chopped off for the better part of a year now. When you flip it and you think about it from the perspective of the old Cordell, he comes out. And there's Dave Milan saying stuff that a lot of Parisians were afraid of saying because a bears out there saying, if you think that way, you should be killed. So the guy is saying, if you don't agree with me, we should just kill you is killed. Yeah, I got to think I got to think that was a pretty popular place to be that day. So over the next week, stemming out of March 24th, the Committee of Public Safety completes its liquidation of the Paris Radicals. Three days after the Ultras were executed, remember that revolutionary army that was so critical to the June and then September insurrections of 1793 that was one of the street demands? It's dissolved. Completely dissolved. Three days after the guys who were the force behind it existing were killed. Tell me that the Committee of Public Safety didn't want to kill them simply to get rid of that. Then, using its authority under the Law of 14 Free Mayor, the committee purged the Paris Commune's General Assembly of anyone it did not like, including its president, Pierre Gaspard Chalmette who you will remember from last week is one of the arch instigators of dechristianization. And then he and another batch of radical ultra sympathizers were arrested and then subsequently executed on April 13th. So you can take this whole right side of my board here and just do this. These guys are all dead. Yes, I'm excited about the gift scheme. Just like that. Just like that. The Paris Commune government was put under the thumb of the, the Committee of Public Safety. And you have to remember, this is important. This is the first time since the flight to Varen that the Paris city government was actually going to be subservient to the national government practically rather than just, you know, the, what's the way it's supposed to be. It, the Paris commune had kind of been leading its own thing and doing its own thing since Bailly had been deposed as its mayor. Since Jerome Petion had taken over the commune. Now for the first time since then, the committee of public safety has gone to the Paris commune, you know, city government and said, Nope. Back underneath our thumb, please. You will do what we say. And that's a pretty big deal. It was once the engine of revolution, period, is where a lot of things came from. People stormed the Hotel de Ville because they knew that is where the revolutionary engine was. And now, thanks to the quick execution of the Ultras and then the quick gutting of the Paris Commune General Assembly... The commune government in Paris is just a broken shell of itself now. The ultras are a broken faction now. They're gone. There's no, there's no fire to be an ultra right now because what just happened? Anybody associated with them in Robespierre's conspiratorial mind would have been led to the scaffold along with Hebert and Vincent and Ranson and Chalmette. To they all have died with them. So it's not you're not going to stand up and advocate being a leftist radical and taking this further and toppling down churches anymore. And that was the intent. So here we are, right? It's the end of March, 1794. The terror is clearly about to start winding down now, right? It has to be. The radical edge is gone. The law of 14 for mayor is in place. Most of the out-of-control representatives on mission have been brought to heel. Jean-Baptiste Carrier, for example, was just recalled to Paris to you know, keep him from you know, further drowning anyone else in the Loire River. Desbois had just reaffirmed his, his loyalty to the Committee of Public Safety. And in a fine and zealous twist, the biggest advocates of an expanded and more rigorous reign of terror were just devoured by it. So this has to be the end of it, right? 
Well, you can't blame people for thinking that at the time. But they all turned out to be very, very wrong. In an even finer ironic twist, the execution of the Ultras, those who were advocating for a bigger and bloodier and more rigorous terror, their execution led to not the end of the reign of terror, but to its darkest days, the so-called historically great terror, which was, of course, run by Maximilian Robespierre, who is following that very narrow path of the truly virtuous revolutionary, which only he could see. The first sign that this was not, in fact, the end of the reign of terror is when the Revolutionary Tribunal turned its attention back to processing all of the people implicated in the East India scandal. And the tribunal was about to cast a far wider net than the facts of the scandal could possibly have ever warranted. The trial of the East India scandal became a blatant attempt to catch the biggest fish of them all, the man who could potentially beat Robespierre and the Committee of Public Safety in a fair political fight. George Danton. On March 16th, the head of the Committee of General Security, which was effectively the head of the National Police Force, that's what the Committee of General Security was, they came forward and they issued a final report on the East India scandal. And the chairman dutifully found that a number of convention delegates and assorted speculators had, you know, for sure... With evidence, we can prove it, committed fraud on a massive scale. That probably should have been good enough, right? Let's go get those guys. We have proof. We can prove their guilt. Let's go get them. But Robespierre found the report lacking. He thought it focused far too much on the financial details and it failed to take into account the broader political crimes. What political crime is committed for being a dirtbag who uses insider trading information to short sell a stock sale and make a bunch of money? What political crime is there? I don't know. But, I mean, the guys involved in the East India scandal are dirtbags, but they didn't commit a political crime. Well, Rosepierre thought they did. So, three whole days later, remember, the scandal breaks in the early days of January, and it takes January to March 16th to get this report done. Three days later, a new report is done. The Committee of General Security comes back with a new report that called for a much more open-ended trial of these traitors of France. So once a bear and the altars were dispatched and executed, the defendants of the East India trial were next up on the tribunal's docket. And as the trial date approached, a debate erupted in both the Committee of Public Safety and the Committee of General Security as to if all of the correct suspects had been rounded up. Some, probably a little bit more ethical, wanted to keep this upcoming East India trial narrowly focused on the fraud, which, you know, was the actual crime. Execute the men guilty of the fraud and leave it at that. Another camp wanted to use all this as an excuse to dispose of the entire indulgent faction and most especially their leader, Georges Danton. And yet again, the swing vote in all of this was Maximilian Robespierre. And though a lot of later historians want to paint Robespierre as not much more than this sort of poisonous man who had an idealized, crazy notion of what people should be and took that to create an idealized idea of France, you know, or else murder them, I'm willing to consider for a moment 
that in this moment, Maximilian Robespierre was genuinely conflicted about going after Danton and Desmoulins especially. Because, yeah, they were friends of Deglantine, and Deglantine had pissed me off. You know, Maximilian Robespierre. He, that dude, he's going to die. But he is friends with Desmoulins and George Danton. And should I scoop them up as a part of the process? You have to remember, it's well established that Robespierre pulled back from any public alliance with the indulgence right after Deglantine was exposed. But it's also well established that, well, it is also well established that, you know, Deglantine's corruption had made Robespierre, you know, suspicious of all of his friends and allies. But Danton and Desmoulins were not aristocratic swine. They, they were not out-of-control rabble-rousers. They were not faceless enemies of the state. Remember, Don, Desmoulins and Robespierre actually had attended school together as children. They were friends. Robespierre was actually the godfather of Desmoulins' son. Danton was privately thought by Robespierre to be an immoral ogre, but it was no secret that you know Danton thought Robespierre was a repressed little prick who needed to loosen up too. But neither had ever doubted each other's revolutionary commitment. And in a couple of key moments, Danton and Robespierre had stood side by side and locked arms when the winds were blowing very, very hard in the other direction. The run-up to the war with the Austrians comes to mind here, when Robespierre was pretty much the only guy to stand up in opposition to Brissot and war and all the war fever, and Danton was the only guy who would stand up and back him. And then think the last episode, when Danton stands up to suggest that the emergency has passed and it's time to wind down the terror, and he gets, you know, gets booed in the Jacobin Club, and the only person in the Jacobin Club that they had to stand up and defend him was Robespierre. They both fought. De they both thought that dechristianization was the height of folly, and they joined forces politically to fight against it. And this is all just a few months ago. It's fair to say that Danton and Robespierre were not friends, but they had certainly had each other's backs for years. So the idea of going after Danton, arresting him, accusing him of treason, and then executing him, could not have been. An easy idea to swallow, even for someone as heartlessly pure as Robespierre. At least I think so. I mean, I could not have a state of mind at all, and he could just be cold, calculating, like, threat, accomplice, and so far gone that he decided it just, just had to be done. Plus, Danton was Danton. He was a revolutionary giant in a true force still to be reckoned with. Going after him might actually blow up in the face of Robespierre and the committee, and it would be their heads instead of Danton's in the basket. So we're going to come back from a break and talk about the final conflict between Danton and Robespierre and how it scoops up all the indulgence. Hopefully you've enjoyed this episode so far. We still have some people left to execute tonight. Don't get to say that often on Twitch, not violate terms of service. Get a drink, stand up, walk around, and I'll be back in just a few minutes.
Welcome back. So here we are. Maximilian Robespierre conflicted about the idea of lumping in Georges Danton. Thank you, Arky. Conflicted about the idea of lumping Georges Danton, who had been his political ally, if nothing else, for several years, and Camille Desmoulins, who was his classmate, he was godfather to Desmoulins' son. He's conflicted about the idea of lumping them in to the East India conspirators in some broader attempt to take down the indulgence. So in March 1794, Danton and Robespierre met twice to try to hash out their differences and avoid some kind of tragic conclusion to their shared revolutionary careers. It's impossible to parse state of mind. I just tried to do it. And I still question myself, right? I just ran through why a rational Robespierre would be conflicted. And I think he is conflicted. But I can't be sure of that. That's not fact. He could just be cold and calculating and evil. And I completely am misreading him from the things he's written. So it's <coughs> impossible to judge state of mind. But I don't think Robespierre was ready to abandon Danton after the first meeting. <coughs> Excuse me. And it's because when Robespierre was pushed to support an arrest warrant for Danton while the trials of the Ultra, which was Ultras, which was the middle of March, was occupying everyone's attention, Ro Robespierre refused to do it. He said, no, I won't support an arrest warrant for Danton. However, at some point before they met again, for the second and final time, on March 29th, Robespierre had made up his mind that Danton posed too great of a threat to be allowed to roam free. And it's because, and he can reach this conclusion logically, because events that go down after the second meeting simply progress too quickly and were too well prepared to have not been premeditated. At the second meeting, Danton begged Robespierre to recognize that his mind was being poisoned. And Robespierre demanded that Danton denounce his old friends from the old Corellie as proof of his commitment to the revolution. And neither of them really heard a word that the other one was saying in the second meeting. And again, it's pretty obvious historically that the indictment of Danton had already been prepared before this meeting. And this meeting's entire purpose, from Robespierre's perspective, was to lull Danton into a false sense of security. So initially, the plan was for Saint-Just to take the floor of the convention on March 31st and denounce Danton and all of his friends. <clears throat> Excuse me. That denunciation would pave the way for their collective arrest under the law of suspects. However, when all this was being laid out, the Committee of General Security, again, the National Police Force, were like, no, 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 whoa, 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 that's your nuts. If you think that you could just denounce Danton, that's the end of it. They demanded that they arrest Danton first. And then his denunciation followed that to catch him off guard. They were petrified that Danton, if he was even given five minutes of a head start, he would kill them all. And so that's what they did. They arrested him first before there was ever a warrant or indictment for his arrest. Now, Danton was, of course, tipped off that an arrest warrant was being prepared and it just really appears that he couldn't believe it. He didn't believe it was true. That it was just beyond comprehension to him that he would be arrested by the tribunal. He founded the tribunal. Through a mixture of ego and apparent misperception and 
what he thought to be the essential nature of his existence to the revolution. He just refused to believe it when he heard it. He believed he was the one man in France that could not be accused of being a counter-revolutionary. And under, like, reasonable mental state terms, he's probably right. At one point, he was the revolution. He was the revolution. He toppled the monarchy. But now he no longer was the revolution. Robespierre was. And Robespierre himself is the one who prepared the indictment. On the night of March 30th, Danton, Desmoulins, and a few other of their close associates were arrested. Remember, Deglantine's already in jail. Also picked up in this roundup was Marie-Jean Hero de Seychelles, the nobleman on the Committee of Public Safety that Robespierre had been denying thanks to Deglantine's foreign plot nonsense for the past several months. Hero had nothing to do, was not a close friend with Danton at all. He was swept up as an excuse because of Robespierre's still paranoia that maybe Deglantine was onto something with Hero at least. Uh, also, because he was an old friend of Danton, and the very recent scourge of the Vendée, General Francois Vesterman was arrested in this sweep. He had just come back to Paris, just in time to be caught up in the whole thing. This is this is General Vesterman, who militarily, like five months ago, had put down forever the Von. Actually, not five months ago, three months ago, had put down the Vendée uprising for all intents and purposes, turned it into a guerrilla war, broke the Catholic and Royal Army three months ago, and he's arrested because of no other real reason than he was Danton's friend. So the trial of Danton and his friends, of course, is a complete farce. But if you think that Georges Danton is just going to sit back and take it, you're out of your mind. In the great tradition of show trials that we have experienced thus far, with the king and the Girondins grinding their respective trials to halts or taking them into rhetorically different, uh, difficult places, this, from Danton, was one of the best exhibitions of the era. And there's something, for me, and many people, about the sub-genre of political show trials, historically, that's entertaining. Because you pick through them and you're like, huh? How did rational people arrive here, right? But the courtroom for the trial of Danton and his friends was packed. The crowd was rowdy and ready for a show, and Don Tong gave it to them. The farce of it all was very obvious from the beginning. All of the East India defendants and Don Tong's group of buddies who were arrested at the end of March were all just lumped together and tried together, because why, why not? Why wouldn't they do it that way? De Moulin was immediately outraged and said, let us be sacrificed alone. What do we have to do with these rogues trying to separate themselves from the actual criminals? When Vesterman was brought in after the others and asked to identify himself before you know, being formally indicted, he refused. Vesterman would not identify himself. Then the judge you know, stood up and declared, well, for, West for Vesterman, yeah, these are mere forms. Danton stood up and said, forms? We are all of us here only for form, which was much to the delight of the audience. And when the judge told them to pipe down and respect the proceedings, Don Tom boomed back that the judge had better respect the proceedings as well, saying, Remember, I'm the one who created this tribunal, so I know something about it. Then the judge rang his bell, signaling for order. And when it did not return to order, he said, Don't you hear the bell? And then Don Tom barked back, A man defending his life does not, does not care about a damn bell? No! He keeps shouting. But the prosecutors, the prosecutors were clever enough, knowing that Danton would continue to simply seize the stage any time he got the chance, they spent the first two days of the trial focused on the boring and entirely provable 
crimes of the East India Company fraudsters. You're right. He went down swinging. Remember, Danton is, you know, he's dyslexic. He can't read. But he's got an eidetic memory, and he is a gifted public speaker. But by focusing on the entirely boring and provable crimes of the East India Company fraudsters, all these financial crimes, you know, they gave Danton no ability to talk because he didn't have anything to do with any of that. But on the third day, they finally had to come around to Danton. And the problem was that they didn't really have much of a case against him and his pals. Except for the vague allegations going way back that he had been too busy apologizing for General de Maurier to realize that General de Maurier was, you know, trying to plot a coup. Then they went further back and tied Danton to his friendship with the now disgraced Comte de Mirabeau, believe it or not. But Danton had very good answers for these allegations. And the prosecutors, of course, had no actual proof of any wrongdoing. And as he parried... Each of these prosecutorial thrusts, Danton counter-demanded that his friends be allowed to call witnesses, which is something that hasn't happened in the tribunal for a while. And Danton evidently planned to call every member of the Committee of Public Safety and no doubt subject them to very uncomfortable cross-examination. Again, Danton was a gifted lawyer. A lot of these guys are gifted lawyers. These demands were, of course, though, you know, repeatedly denied. But it was getting hard for the judge and the prosecutors to maintain order in the trial. Ah, but remember, Gilly, that law requires there to be proof when, in the eyes of the tribunal, proof has been established of guilt. That ends the trial. If within three days proof of guilt has been established. That's the way it's basically written. Well... Ask yourself ethically, is you prove that George Danton committed a crime? I mean, in a true court of law? No way. In the tribunal? I mean, they can pretty much say anything they want. But because it was getting hard to maintain order, and to help speed matters along, the Committee of Public Safety seized on report of a rumor that Desmoulins' beloved wife Lucille had been spotted at the prison where the defendants were being held with a large amount of money. Now, who knows if any of this was true. This was supposedly a bribe to help facilitate a prison break. Remember to clonk that follow button. But there is no real evidence of anything except she might have been there. Not really caring, though, that if the story had any credibility, the committee ordered Lucille arrested on the night of April the 4th. So now everybody on the left side of the panel here is in jail, and most of them are on trial right now. But in addition to this arrest of Lucille de Moulin, which obviously was leverage on Camille de Moulin, a decree was passed that if the defendants did anything further to insult the majesty of the tribunal, that they could be removed from the courtroom. So the next day, April 5th, 1794, Danton once again got into an argument about whether he could call a witness, and the judge invoked the new decree. Now, you would think, Danton's the troublemaker, right? He's the one that'll be removed. No. All of the defendants were removed from their own trial because George Danton was barking. So, as the trial of these men... All of them, Danton's pals and the East India defendants, they were all pulled from the courtroom. And as things came to a conclusion, these men accused were not present for their own defense, which is one of the most basic and fundamental core principles of justice. And yes, without Danton mucking up the works, they no one could do anything to stop everything from coming down on them. The specially hand-picked jurors, and of course they were, were then asked to deliver a verdict pretty quickly after everyone was removed to the courtroom. And, you know, of course they did. Without proof, without witnesses, or the defendants present, they found 
everyone guilty of defrauding the nation and conspiring to restore the monarchy. So this was, of course, an absolutely absurd verdict, right? Danton had become a Republican pretty much after the flight to Iran. He had helped bring down the monarchy. The idea that he was now trying to restore it. Yeah, what a stretch, exactly. But they were found guilty. And then as they waited, their last few minutes in the conciergerie, Danton lamented the poor state that he was leaving the Republic in and allegedly said, quote, If only I could leave my balls to Rose Pierre and my legs to Couton, the committee might live a little longer. End quote. It's prophetic because we're two episodes away from the committee from from the committee going down too. At four in the afternoon on April the fifth, seventeen ninety four, Danton, De Moulin, De Glantin, Westerman, Aero, some of the most dedicated, passionate, ferocious revolutionaries of the revolution, were led onto the scaffold. These were the men who had taken down the Bastille, overthrown the monarchy, sentenced the king to death, and then defended the republic with pretty much every fiber of their being. And now it's time for the revolution, just like the god Saturn, to devour a few more of her children. You wonder if Deglantine pondered lettuce on his way to the guillotine, as this was, of course, 16 Germinal, the day on his calendar that he had set aside for the contemplation of lettuce. De Moulin died, no doubt, fearing for his wife Lucille, not that she would suffer much longer because she was executed one week later. And Georges Danton was, of course, the last of the group to be executed. He had just watched his friends die one by one, and then he approached the guillotine, and he told the executioner, quote, Don't forget to show my head to the people. It's worth a look. Because he was an ugly dude. <laughs> the blade fell. Georges Danton was dead. As was Camille de Moulin, the man who stood on the table and roused the crowds of Paris to storm the Bastille. Dead. General Westerman, Westerman who probably is a nasty bloodthirsty guy but he had just he had just stopped the Vendée uprising dead Marie Jean Hero who member of the committee of public safety dead and so you can take the magic marker and go like this And now four men and seven more of their bodies. Couton, a couple of guys. They are what remains. The Committee of Public Safety has done what we foreshadowed several episodes ago. They have said there is such a thing as too radical and too indulgent. And in a matter of a month, got rid of all of them. Yep, that's a lot a lot of important names taken off the board. Did you ever believe for a moment that those names would all fall in one episode? Because this is the Great Terror. This, beginning with the indulgence dying, is the Great Terror. People are going to die quickly. Because it become, will become a mad scramble for the Committee of Public Safety to effectively insulate themselves from anybody they feel is their enemy. And as they kill more people, guess what? They create more enemies, eventually to the point where the people in the convention itself go, it's just a matter of time. And they do something about it. And that is Termidor, which we'll get to in two episodes. Yes, I'm excited about that. <laughs> But next episode, we're going to go back to that speech that Rose Pierre gave, which I kind of told you he gave right before he got sick. As he continues to lead France along the razor-thin path of the virtuous revolutionary Frenchman that only he can see and define. 
will follow him on this path to the Republic of Virtue, which could, of course, only be forged by its evil counterpart, the Great Terror. And though his accomplice, Saint-Just, has just promised the committee, after the indulgence are dead, that the executions of the indulgence would finally bring an end to the political massacres, it actually would turn out that they were just getting warmed up. So, take solace in the fact that those four guys, the only four guys left on our board tonight, are going to fall soon. But not yet. All the others who are their enemies, some true patriots of what they thought were the rights of the individuals, getting out from under the, the yoke of feudalism, which was at one point what this was about. These guys are gone. They're dead. A lot of them. We just asked a lot of people in this show. And that's why this one was so pivotal. Look at the names. We can go back, way back in this series and point to where Camille Desmoulin came in and where George Danton came in. We can talk about the impact they bear had in the aftermath of Marat's assassination. We could talk about Vesterman and why he was important, at least in the Vendée. But now you've got you know, these four big names plus Couton that are in the middle. Robespierre and Saint-Just are these two masterminds killing everybody. Desbois has got no problem with it. He's out for himself at this point. He's making sure he's, in, he's insulating himself, and he's locked together with his pal Varenne. Yeah, it is egregious. It is egregious to suggest that Georges Danton wanted the monarchy restored. It is absolutely insane that that was something he was charged with. But he's dead. And you probably don't have to look at his horrifying portrait anymore, Rocket, because he won't be back on the board. So hopefully you enjoyed tonight's episode and can take in the impact of what just happened. Because there in the middle is Robespierre guiding this group on this path. And as he kills people on the outside, on both sides, that perceive to be the enemy of the virtuous republic. Everyone else who doesn't agree with him starts to come to that conclusion that we are not like him, and it will be him or us eventually. <laughs> I like Danton more than most of these dudes from the beginning. I shouldn't have gotten attached. I knew better. A couple of people you could have gotten attached to are the Abbe Sayes and Talleyrand. Lafayette. Those are guys you can get attached to. They're going to be around for a while. Abbe Sayes is going to come back around. Um, we haven't talked about him in a long time, but remember, he's the guy that wrote that pamphlet that was basically the instruction manual for how to turn the Estates General into the National Assembly. He'll come back around. He'll come back around and be a contemporary of Napoleon as Napoleon becomes first consul. Well, he let Talleyrand escape. He did. Danton let Talleyrand get out of town. All right, but well, that is tonight's episode. Thank you for hanging out, everybody. We're going to do our quiz here in a moment. Uh, the quiz, for those of you that may be new to it, is just exclamation point answer space and your answer. Don't use the term boy or fix with two X's in your answer or it will trigger a different command and not work. Take a shot. Take a stab. There's no way to get it wrong. Stay away from joke answers, though. Take a legitimate stab at the question. Uh, we like participation here. And we just kind of keep track of how many questions each person gets right. And that's that. So without further ado, here we go to the quiz. Shocking that anyone is left by the time of Napoleon. You're not wrong. Napoleon will be left by the time of the time of Napoleon, as will Talleyrand. Talleyrand is going to come back and be the guy. By the way, that says that's your guy. That's Napoleon. That's your guy. It'll be Talleyrand. Talleyrand is going to be kingmaker for Napoleon. It's one of the reasons he's so intriguing. The first question of the night. What happens here is I will read the question, and then you have one minute type in your answer. Again, it's exclamation point, answer, space, and your answer. And then we'll read through them and give out points. Here we go. The first question of the night. Why was the old Cordelier newspaper such an instant success?
Why was the old Cordelier newspaper, when it launched in December 1793 under Camille de Moulin, such an instant success? Rockets in, Gillies in. Fifteen seconds left. Why was the old Cordell U newspaper such an instant success? We have two answers in. And that's all we're going to get. The first answer comes to us from Rocket. It gave voice to what everyone wanted to say, but was too, care too scared to actually say. Yeah, that is correct. There were plenty of Parisians who did not agree with the Ultras. And we're too afraid of saying so because the Ulsters are out there trying to shave everyone's head with the national razor that did, disagreed with them. And so when someone else is actually publishing and printing what they think, they loved it. Rocket gets it right. What did Gilly say? Gave voice to the concerns of the public left unsaid because they were afraid of being denounced and brought before the tribunal for it. Correct. 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 Gilly gets it. The next question. You'll love this one. It was a short question for me to type. It will not be a short answer. Describe what the French East India Company was. While you're hanging out, and if you're not answering, and that's fine. I don't, well, it's not as answer, but give my friend VT a follow. He stopped by last week, and I was a jerk, and I didn't shout him out. He changed his name under some new branding, but that's the same old VT you guys know. Go give that dude a follow. Rocket is in. Turry is in with 18 seconds left. Describe the French East India Company. Gilly is in. Arky is in. No way. Well, it's about tree fitty. So I will give my answer because it's short and sweet. It was a state chartered company, give a monopoly over trade in the Pacific and the Indian Oceans. That's what it was. Let's see what everyone else says. Skinja, we'll take your answer. It was after the buzzer, but we'll take it. It was a state run company that monopolized the free market, free market in the East and in Africa. Africa is not ac not accurate. Um, Africa was not a part of where their charter was. It was a state-run company that monopolized free market trade in the East. Would be good, so we'll give you the we'll give it to you, Rocket. But not not Africa. You got like ninety percent of it. I said east of the Cape of Good Hope. So nautically east of the Cape of Good Hope, which encompasses trade in the Indian Oceans and the Pacific Oceans. I said the wrong direction in my answer. I'm hopeless. The next answer comes to us from Terry. French East India Company handled all trade west of the Cape of Good Hope and on behalf of the nation of France, a state-sponsored monopoly. It was east. You aren't wrong, and I can't give that one to you, but it was. if you had said trade in the Pacific and Indian Oceans... Eastern trade, any of that stuff would have been right. But west of the Cape of Good Hope was wrong. That would be the Atlantic. The next answer comes to us from Gilly. A monopolistic state-sponsored trade company that suddenly found itself in dire straits after its monopolization was taken away. Had a monopoly on all the trade in the Indian Pacific Ocean. So that's that last line was good enough. State-sponsored is the thing. Um, state-sponsored company. It was The state granted them monopoly, which is insane. But that's what it was. But you got it, Gilly. The next answer comes to us from Arky. The government sanctioned monopoly of trade in the Far East. Yep. GG Arky. And I think we hit the buzzer at that point. And Skinja came in after that. We'll give the answer it's due. It was a state-sponsored monopoly the sole purpose of trading in the East Indies. Yeah, pretty much. Actually, yeah. That's good. East Indies. The East Indies is, you know, basically modern-day Oceania, um, but it also included Asia. But that's that's the gist of the answer. We'll give it to you.
the next question also was very quick for me to write. Won't be short for you to answer. Here you go. Provide a rundown of what was at the heart of the East India scandal. Forty seconds left. Give me a rundown of what was at the heart of the East India scandal. What was at the heart of the East India scandal? Arky's in. 10 seconds. Gilly's in. Rock is in. Terry now afraid of it, talking about anything involving a compass direction. First answer. Skinge is in. The sales of their assets after it collapsed and the bribes paid to allow it. That's pretty good. My answer is this. Corrupt officials had altered the process of liquidation of the East India Company assets so that speculators could make huge profits and cut government officials in to look the other way. That's the base summary, but that's good, Arky. We'll give you a point for that one. The next response comes to us from... Gilly. A corrupt committee decision led to the East India Company being able to liquidate its own assets. True itself without government supervision, allowing a lot of grift, fraud, and kickbacks for the politicians involved and the speculators. But yes, that's good. The East India Company scandal is a lesson in how modern economics has not learned from itself. The next answer comes to us from... Rocket. Members of the convention wanted a piece of the short sales and then fabricated documents to change everything to hide the fact they were getting benefits from said sales. Yep. Specific committee, but yeah. Members of the convention was also good. The committee who had oversight over the liquidation. Any more answers? I think maybe the buzzer hit, and I know Skins has got an answer in. The scandal comprised of shorting the selling of the East India Company. It was an example of insider knowledge being used to defraud the public with zero oversight. Yes. Um... Left out the part where the convention delegates on the committee that oversaw the liquidation changed the rules, but yeah, that's it. Skinja knocks Dustin off the board. The next question. After I fix a typo. What was the big motivation for the Ultras behind their attempted insurrection in March 1794. It's a minute. Now it's 45 seconds. What's the big motivation for the Ultras behind their attempted insurrection in March 1794? By the way, as we're winding things down here today, I should do the thing a person does and say, Jay Mitch, thank you for the host tonight. Rocket, thank you for the host tonight as well. 20 seconds left. What was the big motivation for the Ultras behind their attempted insurrection in March 1794? Rockets and Gillies in with 10 seconds left. Yeah, in the words of Captain Barbosa, the clock's kind of like guidelines and more actual rules. We'll take answers after the fact, but it's there to keep things on pace. Yeah, I don't host people because I'm too lazy to do it. All right, my answer. The Ultras could see the writing on the wall under the Law of 14 Free Mare, and that the committee was getting ready to take out its enemies everywhere. Gilly, they saw the effect of the Law of 14 Free Mare and saw how this, the Committee of Public Safety, which apparently is an acronym we're all using now, was using it to stable dissent on all sides. If they didn't do something about it now, they might never get another shot. Yes, that is the answer. 
pretty much once I read the first answer and start commenting on it, that's the end of me counting people. The second response, I believe, is from Rocket. They saw it was the perfect time to to get rid of the indulgence, and with Robespierre out sick, they saw the perfect opportunity to do so and knock down the Committee of Public Safety. Mm -mm. They weren't going after the indulgence. Um, they saw the perfect opportunity to take out the Committee of Public Safety, um, but they weren't going after the indulgence, so that's not accurate. And there are no other answers. Now, their target, the target of the insurrection was not the indulgence. They were not a a controlling power the Committee of Public Safety was. They saw Robespierre's absence as the opportune moment and the fact that under the Law of 14 Free Mayor, which granted the Committee of Public Safety all of its power, that it didn't do something, everyone was dead. The next question. Explain why the Song Q lot did not rise up with the Ultras in March 1794. Forty-five seconds. Explain why the Song Q lot did not rise up with the Ultras in March 1794. Rocket is in. Gilly is in with 15 seconds left. You also have to remember Skinja. Someone like Gilly's got written notes. He's taking written notes. He's that competitive. Skinja's in. First answer. All of the requests from the last insurrection have been met. Yes. So their anger had been bled out with government officials. They were getting paid on top. Yep. That is a good answer. My answer is they had been given everything they had been demanding the prior September and the committee had effectively put down two different rebellions rebellions, and driven out foreign invading armies. I only copy pasted one answer today. So far, Gilly, every decree they had wanted had already been enacted to varying levels of effectiveness, like the general maximum punishments for hoarding, etc. Yep, that's also fair. It's a good answer. It doesn't encompass all of it, but it's a good answer. Nothing incorrect in there. Skidja. Guessing, but they feared failure and the reprisal that would follow it. No. Nope. So effectively, the general on maximums, the law of suspects, the revolutionary army had been stood up. They had laws against hoarding. They were being paid to attend sectional assemblies now. And the committee had put down the Vendée Uprising, the Federalist Revolt, and had driven all the foreign armies out of France. It's really hard to stand against that. You know, those guys did what we wanted them to do. Now that the Ultras were gone, though, who knows what's going to happen to what all those things were. <laughs> but they wouldn't they wouldn't stand up to the Committee of Public Safety because they got gotten what they wanted. All right. I think that's the last one. Yeah, the convention in the aftermath of September 5th insurrection of 1793 it expressly worked to pacify the streets. A lot of the stuff they did was expressly from the perspective of, whoa, Okay, let's get rid of these Anraje guys because they're nuts. And let's make sure this doesn't ever happen successfully again. And that panned out. Yeah, until at least they start the great murder spree. Give me one second to get the next question in and I will read it out. Why is it possible, and again I stress possible, not historical fact, but possible, that Rose Pierre was conflicted about taking Don, Don, Don Tan and his friends? Remember to flunk that follow button. Why is it possible that Rose Pierre was conflicted about taking down Danton and his friends? Again, thanks for hanging out. Thank you for participating. We have about, I would say, between 12 and 16 episodes left of the French Revolution before we take a break so I can catch my breath after a year of the French Revolution and we go into the consulship and the empire and all on our way to Waterloo um, 
but thank you for being here tonight. Thank you for everyone who's been on this journey with us. 29 episodes, 30. The next episode will be number 30. And if you think about that, I write about 11 to 14 pages typed for every episode. If you take that times 30, I've got a lot of written, written records outline. One of the things I haven't told you guys is I'm actually thinking about writing a book. I have, by the end of this, I will have a complete outline for a narrative. Yeah. Um, but I'm going to write, I think, a historical fiction where I take a creative person within the flow of events from the Assembly of Notables and into the Committee of, uh, or the uh, the National Assembly and just let this, anon this person kind of watch events and Excellent. have their own plot. It would be a waste of what I've done so far to not do something with it, right? I've got 150 written pages down that are detailed. I could certainly write a story around that and make it fit into the context and teach people some history, accurate history from a historical, a fictitious historical perspective without them realizing they're learning history. Yes, I know I'm doing something with it, but I think I could do something more with it. But I think I might come back to the idea once I've gotten past the revolution and can come back to it with fresh eyes again. But anyway, answers to the question of why is it possible that Rose Pierre was conflicted about taking down Danton and his friends? First answer. And let me go make sure I don't miss anybody here by bringing my chat back up. Rocky. Danton had at times been at his side or had his back at key moments that kept him from being bowled over or pushed aside. Yep, they had been political allies for forever. That is a good answer. The other part of that was that, again, De Moulin, who was Danton's buddy, um, had gone to school with Rose Pierre and had uh, Rose Pierre be the godfather of his child. Rocket. Gets a point. The next question, the next answer comes from Gilly. De Moulin and Rose Pierre were friends. Rose Pierre was godfather of his son. Rose Pierre and Danton stood together, united for the revolution in the past when things were pushing hard against them. Correct. There's one other aspect to this answer that has not been said so far. And I'll wait to see if someone says it. Anybody else answer the question? Skinja got in, Turi got in. Rock, or Archie got in too. Because Danton stood beside him politically several times and they had never been enemies. That is true. They had never been political enemies. They didn't like each other. They weren't pals, but they definitely had never been political enemies. Remember when Danton stood up, that first insurrectionary commune, who was on that, right? It was Rose Pierre who was there. Rose Pierre was the Jacobin Club representative to that committee that took down everything. Gilly hits 100. Uh, Terry, Danton had always been a true revolutionary since the beginning. They had supported one another through all the actions they had taken, even if they did not see eye to eye. It's a good answer. That is exactly correct. Skinja gets in there, who I believe. Could easily backfire. That's the other answer. Could easily backfire. And they had been lifelong friends. What if it went down wrong? What if Danton was more powerful and popular than Rose Pierre was guessing? Or estimating? Could have gone bad. That's the other half of the answer. Good job, Skinja. The next question. I think we have four left. One, two... My lord? Three, uh -huh. Four, yep. <laughs> well, one of the other things I likely will do at the end of all of this is I still have four episodes I need to transpose from paper into written notes, but I'm nowhere near ready to do that yet. I still have that book... Over there. Um, but I want to publish the notes uh, at the end of this so that you guys can take them and do something with them and review them. I want to take them and make them into like a, a long form PDF that are broken up by episode title and you guys can just go back through them. I thought about, you know, the reason I started writing it, writing, writing it was because I wanted to auction off the book, right? But it was just becoming too much to write uh, as opposed to typing. I can get it typed in a third of the time it takes me to write it. So. Um, typing it was just the, the right answer. But I'd still like you guys to have a copy of it in hand. Maybe do a nice, you know, cover in PDF form or whatever like that. And just make it. Here you go. Here's the here's the complete edition of the French Revolution by Fictions Heavy Metal History. But the next question. Why was the Committee of General Security insistent that Danton be arrested first and indicted second?
Rocket's in. And Rocket has it. Just gonna go ahead and do this now, Rocket. Actually, I can't because I need it to clear the answer. Gilly's in. I'm just gonna give you the point now because I can see your answer. Because it doesn't delete it from um, Firebot chat. I can still read what you guys write. Gilly's got it too. 20 seconds. Why was the Committee of General Security insisted that Don Tom be arrested first and indicted second? Argument. I didn't even write the answer for this question in my notes just because I know it. They were afraid that he, if he was given any bit of a head start, he would orchestrate all of their deaths, pretty much. They weren't afraid of him running anywhere. They weren't. They were afraid that if he got even a whiff of it, that he would just get them all killed. Rocket says pretty much that. They were scared that he would kill them all, if given any kind of head start. Yep. Gilly. They were afraid of what Don Tong could do before his arrest if he caught wind. Yep. Even though he ended up doing nothing. Arky. Because they're afraid he would run. Nope. That is not it. All right. The next question, of which we have a couple left. Yeah, I don't blame him for his incredulity either. He had a legitimate reason to go, Me? Are you serious? But why was the initial report on the East India scandal problematic for Robespierre? Yep, but that's what that's what the great risk is in believing that you are irreplaceable, that you are unique, and that no one can you know there, you cannot be threatened because of how essential you are. That is the risk in that manner of thinking. Why was the initial report on the East India scandal problematic for Rose Pierre? You have 35 seconds. Twenty-five seconds. Gilly is in. Why was the initial report on the East India India scandal problematic for Rose Pierre? Now nah, you got it. Skin just got it. All right. First answer from Gilly. He focused too much on the financial issues and didn't focus on the character issues and political crimes. Correct. Without the focus on the political crimes, they cannot expand the net is the other key thing there. So that leads me to believe that maybe Rose Pierre did want to use the scandal to catch more people than it should have because he is the one that insisted that the report be expanded so it kind of contradicts my thinking a little bit but that's the great part about history you try to understand someone's thinking you just can't you have to speculate rocket it didn't focus on the political crimes of the people involved and instead on the financial side correct the next one didn't go far enough focus mostly on those committing financial crimes from skinger rather than political crimes that's correct Shame. Shame, Gilly. Shame. Shame on you. Shame. Shame. Shame on you for trying to steal. The next answer. Turry. It showed that Rose Pierre had implicated people in crimes they did not do based on bad information he had previously believed to be true. No. No. It was expressly from the position, as you can see from the other answers, that he didn't he wanted the political crimes against the nation included in the report. It wasn't that he personally had been duped or anything like that. Anybody else? Nope. One more? Nope. Okay. Two more questions. This was a long one for me to write. Should be a short answer for everybody. Who was the original Minister of Justice who created the Revolutionary Tribunal after the insurrection of August the 10th that put, bo put both the Ultras and the Indulgents on trial in 1794? Yep. Yep. Bam, bam. Two people right in with the answer. It's This is to cite the irony. Arky's in. Who was the original Minister of Justice who created the Revolutionary Tribunal after the insurrection of August the 10th that puts both the Ultras and the Indulgence on trial? In 1794, big hint, it was in the opening credits on purpose.
Anybody else? Anybody else? All right. Duh on the answer. George Don Tom, correct. George Don Tom was the Minister of Justice after the insurrection of August the 10th that established the, the tribunal. It is a huge irony that he was executed by the thing he created. Gilly to George Don Tom. Not Dan Don, but I know what you mean. Arky. Don Tom, correct. And anybody else? That is it. Sometimes your fingers are dumb-dumb. Last question of the night before we get out of here. Speak to the irony of the execution of the specific individuals at the end of March and early April 1794. Why is it so such a big deal, effectively, is what I'm asking here. This is one of those opinion questions. I tend to, I don't have an answer room for this. I have my answer, I have what's in my head, but I'm interested in what you guys think. Basically, it's a participate, get a point question. Speak to the irony of the executions of the individuals killed at the end of March and early April 1794. Can type past the, the buzzer, but try to keep it around that time frame. To the app. Boarding, starting, fish, fly safe, get home safe. Please let your family know, meaning us, when you're home and in your house safe as well. Um, thank you for hanging out with us tonight. Hopefully, we kept you entertained while you're waiting for your flight. But have a good night, fish. Time is almost up. People are all still writing, aren't they? Rocket is in. Arky is in. Skinge is in. Let's start taking in these answers. First answer. Really? Oh yeah, because no one was in it for the buzzer. Anyway. Rocket. The people that had originally been part of overthrowing the monarchy and establishing the present government are put in put in front center and killed the same way as the monarchists themselves that they held no mercy for. It's a good answer. My my short answer was these were the founders. These were the guys who founded the revolution in earnest, the end of the monarchy revolution. But that is a good answer. Next answer. Gilly finally got in. Most of these individuals consumed by the monster they created. Yes, that is a very good way to put it, Arky. They were eaten by the thing they made. Skinja, these individuals were those that helped create the system that destroyed them. Yes, they pushed for a more violent fear that ate them. Yes, that is true, especially, even for Danton. Even though he was calling for it to be ended, he did cre help create the terror. That is a good answer. Next response. Gilly. Revolution has now killed several of the architects of the revolution itself, including the person who created the tribunal. Yep. Any mo. I think that's the last one. It is. All right. So again, thank you all for hanging out Let's tonight. Rock! Okie doke. So, we're going to get out of here. Hopefully, we have another episode. Lord, yo. Thank you, Terry. Hopefully, we have another episode done and ready to go by next Saturday. Um, I believe I will. I've been able to kind of keep the pace. So, hopefully, we'll get into the Republic of Virtue next week. And then the week after that will be Termidor. And we'll see what happens to Robespierre and, and Couton and all those guys. But... We'll get out of here. Have a good night. We're going to go raid Fable 42 again. We raided them two weeks ago. They're playing D&D. &D. I think they're funny. Um, that's why I'm going to go over there. Plus, it's a good community. Yes, I'm excited. And the Fable 42 community supports uh, Wounded Warrior Project. So I'm kind of partial to them. So we're going to go over there tonight. So they're playing D&D. they got a great professional presentation. They're a bunch of funny people. Um, so hang out with them. See if you like what they're doing. But before we get out of here, we'll go through our normal stuff. Odd dust and Monday through Friday, 7 30 to 10 30 a.m. I have no clue what he's playing next week because I think he finished what he was doing this past week, but I'm not sure. But hang out with him anyway. There's Perm playing Assassin's Creed Odyssey. And yeah, 
Uh, go hang out with him Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Gilly, Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, playing Dragon Age Inquisition right now, and also It Takes Two with Intent Rocket. And there is Intent Rocket. Tuesdays and Thursdays, sometimes other days, for sure, Saturday morning, playing It Takes Two right now. Thursday evenings with Gilly, give her a follow as well. And then thanks to the people who helped make the music for the show, CF Live. The intro and BRB music are his brain children. Make sure you go give him a follow. He's a talented musician and my friend. And then there's Mr. Land Diggity, who is the lesser half of the Diggity Feast combo, who just got on a plane. Diggity helped with the intro music. A good guy. Hang out with him as well. I'm out of here. I'll see you later. Thank you for being here, and I love you all. The excellent to each other.